Welcome to the Martin Luther King Senior Community Resources Collaborative Live Giving Stay panel. Here, we'll discuss the importance of community-driven philanthropy and how to adapt your developmental strategy so that your organization can thrive in these uncertain times. Our program will begin soon. Begin in three minutes.
Dr. Robin Hensman Stacia is President, Principal Consultant of Sage Consulting Network Incorporated and a Senior Governance Consultant for BoardSource. On behalf of the Martin Luther King Senior Collaborative, I'm excited to welcome you to this great conversation. Deitra was talking to you about 828 Giving Day, and that's why we've gathered today, because this is an opportunity for us to learn more about this amazing day, but also for us to talk to some experts about really what uh, philanthropy should be doing, corporate America, large donors, small donors, what we all should be doing during a time like this. This is a great opportunity for us to have this conversation uh, about 828 Giving Day, which focuses on giving to Black-led and Black-benefiting organizations. This is a time when we really want to connect our giving to the moment and to the movement that is calling out for racial justice and equity. And we know that many of our Black-led and Black-benefiting organizations are those that are at the grassroots level and who are working with individuals who have been historically and persistently marginalized. So we've got some amazing panelists um, who are going to share their expertise with us today. And so I'm going to give you a chance to hear a little bit about these panelists. Anne Wilson Kramer is a senior consultant with Cox, Curry, and Associates. In this role, she provides strategic consultation to nonprofit clients to strengthen their capacity in the critical areas of board development, volunteer engagement, corporate relations, and fundraising. Charmaine Ward-Milner is Corporate Relations Director for Georgia Power. She is responsible for building and maintaining key state and national relationships with diverse organizations and opinion leaders. Lauren Rock is a Director of Individual Engagement at United Way. In this capacity, she helps the organization excite and mobilize individuals to pursue their dreams for social and systematic change. Okay, so we're still having some technical difficulties. Uh, let's try this. Yeah, we're still having problems hearing Dietra, which is unfortunate. I'm not sure what's going on. And hopefully they're going to be able to resolve that. So we're going to jump right into our questions. Um, and then Dietra again is going to come back and talk to us about the Martin Luther King Collaborative, as well as talk to us about 828 Giving Day. So I want to come right in and start with our panelists. Um, who are gonna really shed some great light about what this day is about for them. And this question is to all of our panelists. Um, we want, first of all, we wanna thank you for joining us today because we know that by yeah, your agreeing to participate, yeah. you are saying- You have the little that, uh, lip up at the top too. That, that someone's, um, okay, I think I'm still there. By, that by your agreeing to participate, that you really believe that this discussion is important. So we know that this is challenging times. This is challenging times for nonprofits and it's particularly challenging for black led and black benefiting organizations and for those that they serve. We know that many communities um, are disproportionately impacted by COVID, um, by the economic downturn that has resulted from COVID, as well as by what we continue to see as these brutal racial and social injustices. So we know that the moment is important and the movement is important, but I'd like to hear from each of you about why you decided to participate in this conversation. Because I always say to everyone I work with, it's a personal mission first. We have to feel that this matters to us first. So that's what we wanna hear. Let's start with Lauren. Lauren, if you can share why you decided to participate in the 828 uh, National Giving Day conversation and what this means to you. Absolutely. Um, so good evening, everyone. My name is Lauren Rock. I'm Director of Individual Engagement at United Way of Greater Atlanta. And Robin, thank you so much for hosting us um, and really kicking off this conversation. So I would say this is extremely important to me at this time and just generally because Black philanthropy and Black giving is, is a product of who I am. Um, I am and have been surrounded by a number of individuals as well as organizations that have continued to lift me up. Um, just even thinking about the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, that is completely centered around that exact concept of Black giving. And so um, 828 Day is very important to me in being able to elevate that. Um, beyond that, you said it 
just right. This is a time when black led and black benefiting organizations need us. Um, there was a conversation that United Way held earlier today, a town hall talking about ed economic mobility. And one of the comments that was made by our experts um, in, on the panel was saying that truly businesses and organizations that are rooted in the black community are what's going to drive and being able to invest in them is what's going to drive that mobility, that strength, that empowerment. And so money, financial giving is the way that we, we make that change. Um, and then lastly, you know, it's my, my being. I mean, I buy black, <laughs> um, I engage black. And so why not continue to promote um, and elevate the ways that I see myself in the community, but also see um, black people in the black community being able to benefit um, our, our greater communities. Wow, thank you so much, Lauren. That's, uh, that was an amazing, um, I think the way that you connected that both with what's happening with the United Way as well as personal, because that's that personal piece that we're talking about that drives our work. That's what gets us up each morning. So thank you. I'd love to hear from you, Anne, who you know, we all admire so much and you're just such a pillar of philanthropy in Atlanta. And we'd love to hear why you uh, said Have yes, you you're joining in this conversation. Oh, Robin, thank you so much. And to you, Dietra, we want to hear from you. But I do think this is sort of like what Lauren was describing. I am a white privileged person as a woman. And when I understood what 828 means, starting with Emmett Till, it's both humbling, but also catalytic as to why I am here. And like Lauren said, it is the passion that drives me, but it's more than passion. How do I listen? How do I learn? How do I think and meditate and pray about the kinds of things that I can do? And then how do I act? And so when you think about the whole reason for 828, looking first at this is a date for the death of, of Emmett Till, yeah. that it is the time when we had an MLK, we were all doing the I Have a Dream and then you look at Katrina, as we see Laura pounding on Louisiana once again. And then the date that Obama got to be nominated for the presidency. And then, of course, our young Black and giving back. It's how do we encourage philanthropy? How do we encourage philanthropy among white, privileged people and Black people? has been so important. So I come with both passion and purpose, but even more, how do we share and connect folks that have access to resources that can then provide those resources to those Black-led, Black-owned, and Black-founded organizations that are so critical to the success of not just our Atlanta community, but to the whole country. So it's not only do I feel so honored to be here, but I feel so grateful for the work that's going on that Dietra, you're doing at the center. So thank you, thank you, thank you for this privilege. Dietra Russell is Executive Director for the Martin Luther King Senior Community Resources Collaborative. This nonprofit was founded by the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church and seeded by Casey Family Programs to disrupt generational poverty by creating sustainable pathways to economic mobility and empower disenfranchised citizens through social justice reform. Thank you all so very much for your patience and just being flexible with us today <laughs> as we get through this discussion. So as you can see, this is exactly why I appreciate the women who were here to support this event today, because even in small issues like that, they stood right in the gap for me to make sure we got off to a great start. So Dr. Robin Heinzman Stacia, again, a great friend of the collaborative, an amazing business leader, and just a supporter that we are privileged to have with us tonight. So thank you again, Robin, for kicking us off and making sure we stayed on track with our timeline and keeping our panel going. Thank you to each one of the panelists. Each one of you has been so supportive of me and the collaborative. I appreciate you each. Ann Kramer, I can't tell you how important it's been to have your friendship and support over probably more than two decades, um, although I hate to admit it, since I was a Spelman uh, student uh, in Atlanta. And so I am grateful for you to be here with me tonight. Charmaine, I've come to know and get to know through my corporate 
and my nonprofit career and just your level of support and gracefulness in the nonprofit environment is just amazing. And Lauren, who I've recently got to know, and I am excited about having you on the panel tonight because of the expertise and energy that you bring around giving uh, in today's time. So thank you all very much. And Robin, I greatly appreciate you for kicking us off. And so I will turn it back over to you. I'm just grateful for us to be here today. And I'm poised and ready if you have anything you'd like to ask me as well. So thank you all. Okay, wonderful, Dietra. And we'll definitely come back to you uh, because we want to hear. Um, Anne gave us a little bit on the purpose of 8 Giving Day, 828 Giving Day, but we're going to want to hear a little bit more about that. So uh, we'll, we'll save some, some time at the end uh, for you to be able to provide that overview. Let's go to Charmaine next. Charmaine, we'd love to hear why you said yes to this conversation and, and what's your personal um, perspective on this kind of work? Thank you, Robin. And I also want to thank Deetra and her leadership and my panelists. And I'm going to pivot off what they said. Lauren mentioned purpose. And then Anne came back and said purpose and passion. And I'm going to add to that intentionality, right? When I heard about Give 828, I said, are you kidding? I have to be a part of this. And I've already started telling people and asking people, are you familiar with this? Do you know about this? You need to get on board. And when I saw those, those pivotal dates that Ann just shared with you, I mean, it just, it touched my heart. When I think about philanthropy, it is part of my DNA. And so I am very intentional every day, every conversation, every action that I do, that it in some way moves forward philanthropy in this community and the broader communities. So when we think about it, we really have to say, okay, philanthropy is important, but black philanthropy, it has always been challenged. I mean, it goes back to mm -hmm. just some of the things that we're talking about today with social injustice, right? Systemic. And so from the very beginning, where has black, black led and black benefited organizations started? With the churches. Philanthropy is not new to the black community. It started many, 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 many years ago when we started giving to black churches and then they were the ones that helped those in need. And now that has really evolved into what we see today. So many amazing nonprofit organizations across the spectrum, but specifically amazing organizations that are black led, black founded, which I love in that you added that and black benefiting. And so Give 828 is really for them and it's about them and it's to elevate, to highlight and to celebrate. And so that when we go out and we start talking about philanthropy, that we make sure that we're being inclusive and intentional. And so that's why I'm here today. Oh, Charmaine, I love that. I love the full circle. Um, I love the inclusive and the intentionality. And so let's go, let's build on that. Um, and I have a question for you. What should philanthropy leaders do to strengthen and deepen their leadership capacity really to be inclusive and to be intentional, just as Charmaine said, about funding for equity-driven work to Black-led and Black-benefiting organizations? So let's, let's start with that. Anne. Oh, Robin, I love that question, so thank you. Um, Three things. Everybody knows I'm a finger person, five fingers on a hand or three points. But let me first say I do both acknowledge the kind of gravity in which this situation in this country is. The country is in a pivotal point. A lot of foundations and corporations have made extraordinary offers to be engaged in racial healing, racial reconciliation, equity, and even building up the whole idea of racism and economic impact. And I will give credit, and Robin, as you know, the work of the South Asian Council and Foundations, the Georgia Grant Makers Association and the Atlanta um, Foundations Forum have done a wonderful job, frankly, of being real with the foundations and philanthropists in Georgia. In fact, one of my favorite sessions was when our friend Nathaniel Smith with the Partnership mm -hmm. for Southern yeah. Equity really told it like it was and made us all very much feel <laughs> that kind of incense that in fact most of the money 
that's a part of the foundations. And yes, Charmaine, for even for IBM and for Georgia Power, has come on the backs of black people, slaves, and how to claim that. And so as we think about the question that you ask is how can philanthropy, whether it's philanthropists, foundations, family foundations, and personal giving from people, that they're really kind of three things, especially for foundations that they can do. First is very simply, 5% of your principled income is only the base. It is the floor, not the ceiling for which they can give. The second, of course, is pretty simple, is that you can really add people of color to your board and to your staff <laughs> to build a real kind of talent pipeline so that you can't say, oh, there was nobody available or nobody experienced. No person of color, no black person was available to do the job because they didn't have any kind of job experience as well as board experience. And of course, to me, one of the most important things is to really review what was written in those wills. I have a great, I, I mean, a great experience where one of the grant committees that I get to serve on, we really reviewed those stipulations and it said health, direct service. And we realized that race is a public health issue. So why can't we give to the organizations that work on working on public health related to race hmm. as opposed to direct service. So it's kind of simple, right? Changing and listening to those stipulations of those wills that we think are sacred, uh, no. How do they reflect today's environment? And of course, the fourth thing is that we create those advisory boards and relationships and cross the bridge of those two-way streets two-way bridges and begin to invite, I love Charmaine, intentional, invite, welcome, connect, build trust, and therefore invest in those Black-led, Black-founded, Black-related kind of organizations that we know are critical to our community. So are, we're on the beginning of the precipice, but as you said, Robin, this is a two-way street. So when we go later in the program, I'm going to talk about what the organizations can do to cross that bridge, to cross that street, and so how we can begin to build relationships that will be long-term so that those, re those investments are a part of trust and relationship and long-term investments. Well, thank you, Anne. That two-way street is, first of all, a great analogy to what it really takes, which is a later question, but what it really takes <laughs> to create, I can't, I just have to say a sustainable donor relationship. relationship. So that's a tease for everybody who was thinking they're gonna jump off the line early, mm -hmm. don't, because you're gonna get some really good information. But right now we're gonna take a pause for the cause, as we say, for a, a quick informational moment for you. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. Let's take a moment to recap the significance of 828 and why this day is important to all of us. 14-year-old Emmett Till was brutally murdered. Dr. King delivered his iconic I Have a Dream speech. Hurricane Katrina made landfall in Louisiana. And Barack Obama accepted the Democratic nomination for president. All of these significant events happened on August 28th. I am excited about this 828 National Giving Day, and I want you to be excited too. So let's get back to the discussion. That gives me chills um, to hear of the connection of so many important things that have happened in the lives of Black people within this country on this, on 828, on that particular day. I want to remind everyone to please use your chat box to enter any questions or comments that you have. We're going to periodically go to the chat box. And if you have a question for any of our panelists or even for me or for Dietra, um, we're going to have an opportunity to answer those. So I've been watching the chat box and at this moment, I'm going to check in with Deetra. Uh, I don't see any questions there, but I may be missing them. So I'm going to check in to see if there's any questions or comments, Deetra, that you'd like to share in the chat box, from the chat box. We're still monitoring, Robin, so we haven't found anything, common things or whatever, but great comments being made. So as soon as we get a question, we'll come back and I'll share that with the group. Okay, very good. 
So we're going to move on because we have lots of questions. So our next question is going to go to Charmaine. Um, Charmaine, when we look at corporate giving and philanthropy donors, um, how can we get them to go beyond the corporate statement? I think we've been all, you know, impressed and um, also uh, apprehensive about the number of corporate statements that we've seen come out. And we know that it's one of those get on the bandwagon things, but we want corporate America, we want philanthropy, we want them to go beyond that statement and to really get engaged. So uh, share with us what you think the elements are to corporate America joining this movement and supporting and including giving uh, for Black-led, Black benefit organizations. Thank you, Robin. And I think that is a great question, but I am gonna go at it from a little bit different perspective okay. because first of all, I just wanna applaud the companies that are coming out with statements. I mean, this is a big deal. We have been looking at, I mean, when I say we, I've been looking at several statements, copying those statements, people are sending them from various companies and what they're doing and what they're saying. It, it's incredibly impressive. That's, that's a start because you have to be aware first. The first step to solve any problem, the first step to get anything done is to be aware of the problem. And now because of everything that has gone on, we're seeing companies that are, I mean, my millennial daughters like to use the word woke, right? Um, and I'm like, okay, but they are, they, they are there because it's this new awakening, right? And I'm going to use that word. And so we're seeing these statements that are, that are compassionate, that show empathy, that, I mean, are apologi apologizing. And they're saying, we recognize what happened. We recognize, and Ann mentioned, that many of our companies were built on the backs, right, of so many brown and black people. And to see that just in print, I think is a huge first step. So now you're saying, what's the next step? How do we pivot from there? And I think what we have to do is we have to give corporations and corporate foundations something to work with. And so that means nonprofit organizations coming up with their own plans around social injustice and how they think they can address it, how they think they can close the gap, and what that means is coming up with some innovative programming. Nobody wants to see the same old stuff that's been done because it hasn't worked. And now maybe there wasn't a lot of money, but there was some money, but it hasn't worked. So what can we do? And not to say throw the baby out with the bathwater, but what can we do in addition to what was already being done? So I think number one is coming out with innovative programming initiatives, um, even virtual events because of the pandemic, that's what we, we have, the limitations we have to work with. And then number two, showing how those different events are impactful. What metrics are around them? How many people are they going to impact in terms of stakeholders? And I will tell you, because of the pandemic and everything being virtual, it is huge how now organizations can touch so many more people. The impact is two and three and fourfold from what it used to be. But you need to be able to put that together and to package that and to present it to the corporate foundations so that they have something to react against and something to consider. So I think that's one of the things that nonprofits need to do. And the other things they need to do is take this time to get their house in order. We're telling individuals and professionals, take this time. This is when you can read, you can go walk, you can get your health together. Well, it's no different for nonprofit organizations. And I'm talking to organizations every day and I'm so encouraged. They're like, we are gonna be so technology savvy when this is over. We are gonna be able to increase everything we're doing, Charmaine. So they are taking the time to really look at their strategic plans, their infrastructure, their technology, even their facilities, they are taking that time to come out of this better than where they started. So I think that when you look at organizations reinventing themselves, coming up with programmatic um, thrust and programmatic initiatives that are innovative, that close the gap, showing metrics, showing impact, 
I think those are the types of things that will cause corporate foundations and corporations to really look, to begin dialogue, to sit down and say, this is just what we were looking for. This is how we think we can take that statement and make it come alive, right? This is something we can give additional dollars to and invest in. Because one, we already believed in the organization. Now we see how you've reinvented everything that you're doing. And you've come to us with this amazing program or made the program that you had even better. I think those are the things that nonprofit organizations can do to help corporations and corporate foundations bring those statements to life. Wow, thank you. That was, um, that was so much information. And I love... Um, basically what you're saying is that those corporations who start with um, their, their, their corporate statement of support have their hands up and they're saying, we are ready to wait to work. And as you said, whether they are awakening or they're on that journey, um, they've got their hands up to the community. And I hope that that also means that they have their arms open to the community, but it is again, going back to Anne, a two way street. And you linked into that again, Charmaine, with the work that nonprofit organizations have to do as well. So let's go to Lauren now, who we want to hear more from you, Lauren, about the details of what nonprofit organizations do on their side of the street. So what recommendations do you have for Black organizations to effectively, um, I don't even want to use, uh, to, to effectively become, I guess, much more competitive and, and better partners? Um, to uh, for these very important dollars, as Charmaine said, whether it's a, a, a smaller donation or whether uh, an organization is elevating your donation to some sustainable level. And if you could talk a little bit about strategy, because that's really what they need, strategy for development and strategy for their fundraising. Absolutely. Um, another great question. I think, Charmaine, your comments were, were a perfect segue into this question. Mm -hmm. yes. So Charmaine used a couple of words, innovation. Um, we are all in the nonprofit sector here and you've got to be innovative. You've got to think differently. You've got to be creative. And that can be a little scary. <laughs> you know, we, we're so used to being in the same mode. And this time has really shaken things up for us and caused us to react. But there is a way that we can be proactive. And so I would completely encourage my, my colleagues and partners in the nonprofit industry, as well as our supporters, to be patient and also to be considerate of how these things are coming about. So what I would start by saying is let's, let's be real. You can be innovative, um, but be realistic. So really what I'm urging and encouraging you all to do is rethink how you might be using existing resources, how you consider to maximize them. Um, some of the things that we typically do and that you see is People always say, yes, go ahead, connect with donors, connect with volunteers, recruit more donors, recruit more volunteers. Sure, and people are going to be knocking at your door. I'm sure a number of people have already said, what can I do, how can I help? Um, beyond just hearing from them and inviting them in, utilize that person and those people as champions. Allow them to tell your story and continue to sell who you are, the impact of your organization, and really just the value that it brings to not only this community, but just overall the issues that you're trying to solve. And so really that is going to give you an opportunity to leverage something very natural and also will allow you to bring people in. It's a natural, natural marketing tool, very organic and a great way to make connections. Those ambassadors are invaluable. Um, as you consider people connecting with you, talking about your work, you also wanna rethink how things are happening in terms of appreciating them for that. Um, I know in a number of the organizations that I've been involved with, people say, I don't know, I don't have a budget for incentives, I don't have a budget for recognition, um, but just think creatively. Um, some of the things that you might do for young and new donors um, during this time are, are really, really small touches. Um, being able to say thank you in a way that is unique and personalized to someone is a great way to just show that you were listening to them. And so I think that's a, a great opportunity to be able to do that, but also to be able to bring their connection back to your cause and drive them to continue to be motivated to, to promote your organization. 
Um, beyond that, Charmaine talked a lot about partnerships with the corporate sector, as well as potentially government and other, other angles of industry. And so I think the other opportunity that we have is to think innovatively and creatively about how we approach partnerships. All money is not good money. <laughs> I want to say that one more time. All money is not good money. And so you really want to think creatively about who's coming to you and how they're continuing to advance your mission and how they can be a strengthened long-term partner, not just a short-term partner. So as you talk about strategy, Robin, I think there's a great opportunity for you and your team when someone says, hey, we want to do something more with you. Bring them in, invite them to just share, have a conversation about what that really looks like and make that a relationship versus it being as transactional. And I understand that some of you are working with very lean teams. Another great opportunity to utilize volunteers, champions like Anne, champions like Charmaine, who know some of these partners as well, and being able to leverage the relationships that they have um, with some of these individuals as well. And then lastly, I would really just say and echo what Charmaine said about virtual experiences. Um, there's an opportunity for us to do something different than what everyone else is doing. Your product is your mission. Your product is your mission. So you are delivering and offering something that is unique, even if it might advance you know, the great things that are happening or potential of the Black community, the way you want to deliver that service is unique for a reason. And so be able to think um, deeply and creatively about why you do this work and where that's at. For example, for me, a lot of times I think about the ways that I want to experience um, things as a donor. Um, I give to other organizations, even though I work in the nonprofit or, um, sector. And so I think about what might I want? What might my friends want? What might my parents want? And really use that as a way to leverage. So really bringing it back again and rethinking those, those existing resources is, is great, especially if you're working lean. Um, if you have some opportunity, happen upon great grants, dollars, um, start to explore what is possible with those as well. Um, and so I would say, you know, you don't want to spend it all in one place, but there's a great opportunity nowadays to leverage the software as well as the different enhancements of a number of platforms. Think about your email newsletter. Think about how you utilize social media. People are really plugging into each of those spaces as well. And so how do you enter into that conversation? I spoke earlier about town halls. A lot of people are having conversations with subject matter experts as well as volunteers in their sectors. Find a way to, to connect and have people, again, share their stories and collaborate. Um, you also can leverage dollars to continue to connect with other partners, um, and, and that's a great opportunity. I know some that people are thinking through recently is how you might partner with another organization and servicing a similar need to maybe host a virtual 5K, to maybe host a virtual event, fundraiser. Um, there are different opportunities for you to leverage those dollars um, in a way that, again, brings the community back together. And I would just say um, the last thing that I'll end on is um, I've been really excited about Black Philanthropy Month for a really long time. And one of the things that I saw um, posted on, on Twitter actually was 31 ways to give this month. And so I think the other thing is that we have to think about giving as a multifaceted thing. Yes, we want to at the end of the day get dollars, but it's a journey. And so you have to remember that there are several touch points that people are going to go on to be able to fully actualize and make that gift. So be patient, understand that you are planting seeds and that they will sow and will be very fruitful down the line. Wonderful, Lauren. That was amazing. One of the things I want to add to what you just said, I want to highlight, and that is don't leave your boards behind. You know, my work is with board of directors, trustees of uh, philanthropy organizations and leaders. Quite often what happens is the executive director and the staff are way out ahead of the board. And you guys are deeply engaged in the work. You're, you know who these donors are, these philanthropists are, who you're trying to make these connections with. Don't, don't lose your board. Your board is also a resource. When you look at those folks around the board, they're one of your most valuable resources of the organization. Um, tap into them, give them assignments, teach them how to talk 
about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Help them to develop their own message. Bring training into the board. Give the board reading lists, videos, ways in which they can go deep. Carve out time doing board meetings to talk about your work and connect your work to diversity and equity. And as Charmaine said, show the data, disaggregate the data, help your board to see how certain communities are lagging. Bring them along in this. And that's one of, gonna be one of your most important strategies uh, for development, for networking, for furthering everything that Anne, Lauren, and Charmaine said, is when you've got a strong board working in partnership with you, you're gonna be able to get a substantial amount um, of support from the philanthropic and the corporate foundation community. So I wanted to add that. And then we're gonna take another very quick informational break and we'll be right back. Hi, my name is Charmaine Ward Milner and I just wanna tell you why celebrating 828 is so important, not just to the black community, but to all communities. 828 is a day of celebration and a day of giving. 828 is highlighting and elevating Black-led and Black-benefiting nonprofit organizations. Why is this important? Because Black giving is magic. Oh, I love that. Black giving is magic. So we have a very active chat box right now. So I'm going to go to Deetra and see what questions would you like to raise or themes from that chat box that our panelists might very quickly touch on. There were a couple of questions, one for Charmaine I saw come in, one direct, directly for Anne. So uh, I'm, I'm going to you, Dieter. Okay, thank you, Robin. I appreciate that. You're right. And we are excited because you are asking questions that are very important to you that we believe will add to the discussion that we have begun tonight. And we hope that this discussion will continue. So. I am gonna go back to my longtime friend, Anne, on this question because I think sometimes people think that it's not um, apropos to ask certain things. And so we have a viewer that wants to simply know, Anne, thank you so much for your honesty and transparency as you identify as a privileged white woman. Can you please share your experience about interactions with your counterparts and how you've been able to bring them on board to this support? Great oh, yes. question, as always. Great question, Dietra, and whomever asked it, that on the chat. And I do think a lot of it is a journey, but in the short term, it has to be clearly stated and have people held accountable. And as I mentioned, and as Charmaine was um, giving a little credos, we've had an amazing time during COVID through the Southeastern Council Foundation and Georgia Grant Makers where we have heard stories about the economic, health, education, inequities, criminal justice, the list goes on, and the role that white people have been involved. And I've watched people's faces, and I've heard their voices, and actually seen people begin to be willing to be held accountable, and to be in the arena, to be a part of the solution. I know many of the foundations that have really struggled, as you were saying, Charmaine, with DEI. What does that mean? How does that reflect with the grant making that we have been doing, and that we will do? And as we've seen, the hundreds of foundations and corporations that are on the list, in fact, I get it every day through the Chronicle of Philanthropy, those organizations that say we are committed to the issue of racism, racial equity, and all the inequities that face our communities. The question that I think for you, Deetra, and for all is to how we hold each other accountable. Yeah. I was on a, I spoke to a group of my collegial friends, both for corporate foundations and um, large private foundations. And the question I asked are, are you serious? We begin to say, this is what we want to do, but are we serious? Do we fund at the level that will make a difference or do we dabble in the issue? So I think for all of us as white privileged people, and for instance, even within corporate foundations and for all the large private foundations, it's how we hold each other accountable. 
And I'm willing to do that as a part of those connectors across the bridges and across the streets is to be able to ask those questions for and with each other and make sure that we enter the arena in a way that has authenticity as well as begins to focus on yeah. results for all the organizations that we know we care about. So I love the question. It is not easy. It's a journey. I think the blessing of the COVID as well as the revealing of the 1619 two pandemics mm -hmm. is that it gives us a chance to not just reflect, but to act with intention on the kinds of investments that can be made to break the systems and the structures that have been barriers to the health and humanity for so many people for so long. Got it. Excellent. Wonderful. Very good, Anne. Thank you so much for that. Robin, I think I'll go to one other question that we have. Yes. Is that okay? Yes, I think that's great. Please All right. Do. This next question, I, and I do want to for a moment say that Anne is, is very uh, on point with her comments, particularly about being serious in corporations. When we started the MLK Senior Collaborative, it obviously, um, most people may not know, it is, was spearheaded by the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church. And we clearly needed partners to come, along, come alongside us uh, to stand that organization up. And we were fortunate because we had the Casey Family Programs, which is um, the UPS Family Foundation. It's the largest operating foundation in the United States. And it was founded by Jim Casey, who actually founded UPS. And so we were fortunate and we had the level of support um, that has gotten us to the point where we can continue to grow our mission, do the work that we need to do in our community and bring along and attract new funders to our mission. And so our goal every day is to definitely disrupt generational poverty while creating sustainable pathways to economic mobility and actually to empower disenfranchised citizens through social justice reform. And so through that, we have to have allies and people who come alongside that work that, as Ann said, are serious. And so uh, that's where we are. And that's why this conversation today was important to us, because we know what that support has been to us. And we want to see other organizations that we partner with and that we support throughout this community and abroad find the same level of support and also find people who are serious about helping them as well. And so I'll move to the next question for Charmaine. And we've got, like I said, great things coming through the chat. And this question for Charmaine is, as a member of corporate America, how can we sustain the current momentum behind DNI, which I like to call DEI, mm -hmm. and the support of African-American nonprofits? So that, that is, wow. That is a million dollar question, right? Is sustainability. So I think we're seeing the statements come out. I think we're seeing a lot of corporations um, make big investments or at least make commitments to big investments. But the question is sustainability. And that I think is two things. I think it is, we have to keep the corporation accountable, mm -hmm. but we also have to keep the communication open and the conversation going. So we can't let the conversation stop as members of the community. We have to keep saying, okay, that was the statement, that was the investment, now where is that money going? And now nonprofits, where are those programs that that money went to? So we have to hold everybody accountable. It's this full circle and everybody on every point of that circle has to be in 100%. So sustainability is not going to come by one person or one company doing anything. It's going to come by the community saying, we want to see you do what you said you were going to do, corporations. By the corporations saying, we said we're going to do this, now give us some things to react to. Give us some things to invest in, right? And then it's going to be those community members saying, wow, this is what we needed. This is helping us. This is helping us reduce food insecurity. This is helping us get job training. This is helping us get off the street. So we need to hear from all of those different groups to know that everybody is holding, is holding everybody accountable. And that's the way I think we can start to begin to see sustainability. But we can't, we can't let up off of anyone. Wow, Charmaine, I love that. You know, years ago, um, there was, an article in the Harvard Business Review 
that review corporate giving in, in international um, third world countries. And the key things that they found for really creating the change was what Ann said, A, getting serious and saying that we really are working to make a difference. B, staying in for the long haul and recognizing that um, inequities that have been persisting for 400 years do not get better in five. And so when uh, corporate giving begins to shift, it is the responsibility of those they've been giving to to keep them focused on the long journey that this change takes, but also to show them, as you said earlier, Charmaine, the data. So where are those incremental improvements happening? So that even though we may not be reaching the goal, because many of us are very unrealistic about, the, about how fast change happens <laughs> and about the impact that the dollars they invest can achieve over a period of time. And so no one is an expert at this. Um, people are doing it, but and when it comes to change, it's, it's very variable. So I love your comments because they really fit very neatly into that original work that HBR uh, developed that I talk about all the time. And that's be serious about it, go big with your money and stay long. And for me, I think that's the key. And that's what we're hearing from you all. So Robin, you. I just, Robin, Robin, can I? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, nope, go ahead. And Robin, Char I just, Charmaine I, and then Deidre. Okay. I just want to add, because you mentioned this is a journey. And mm -hmm. what I think when we're talking about accountability, I, I just want to dig a little bit deeper. We need milestones. So we need milestones because yes. nobody mm -hmm. wants to just work, 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 and never feel like anything got better or anything got done. So we need milestones, milestones in this long mm -hmm. journey so that a year from now, did mm -hmm. we improve in the community? Did we improve the metrics? Did we improve the impact? So then year two and year three, but we have to base it on the data. I mean, I think for so long we've had some data and we've had a lot of anecdotal stories, but now that people are becoming aware of what really has happened over years and years and years mm -hmm. and why we cannot just turn around on a dime. I mean, I love, I think the quote that, um, someone said is that, you know, we have to, be able to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. And Martin Luther King said, but we don't have no boots. So how are we going to do that? Right? I love that. I love that. And so I think that's where we are right now is as a community understanding that we have to build the boot, right? Yeah, so that people yeah. didn't have the bootstrap. But where are the milestones that, okay, we put the sole down. Okay, now we put the leather up. Now we sold it together. And I mean, I'm taking a really simple um, example, but I really think that we have to begin to see that it, it is somewhat simple in terms of how we can look at it. It's a complex issue. I mean, and it's all interconnected, but we need to have simple metrics, simple milestones, and we have to have open communications and dialogue between all of the parties. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful. And I, I love the reminder of the bootstraps. That's a great analogy. Dietra, you wanted to add in on this. Go I did. Ahead. You know, one of the things that's great to hear from people who actually work in this space and definitely um, the, the talent and the insight that Charmaine brings from being on the corporate philanthropy side, from the nonprofit space, um, you know, the, the answer is right. She's dead on. We have to have milestones. We have to also uh, figure out what success looks like in the short and long term. And we have to be realistic about that. And while we've had funding sources that have come alongside us to stand us up, you're right, they can't live with us forever. And so for us, we have to be mindful as nonprofit leaders to also do things that I call friend raising. There's fundraising and then there's friend raising that you need. And so a lot of times, you know, in this space, I have the pleasure of having come out of, you know, a corporate and other large uh, national nonprofit spaces. And so I was able to bring some of that insight of very efficient operations and data driven uh, results and tracking and metrics and stuff. And so that was helpful. But the areas where I wasn't strong in, I had to be willing to reach out to people and to raise, you know, my um, level of understanding in certain areas that made me stronger in this particular position so that I can advance this mission. And that means that I do have to show up for certain meetings and meet new people. I have to listen in and come 
find locations like this and other platforms where I can learn and get insight from people who are doing it and people who have done it before me. And so um, that's important for us on the nonprofit side to know that it is a partnership between those of us who are on the ground doing the work every day and those of us who are actually helping to fund that work. And we have to be able to foster those good relationships to have ongoing dialogue of how we can make this um, a strong partnership going forward. And so we do have still more interest and questions in the chat. So yeah. Robin, let me know which way you want to go. We're going to go to our next question. And then if you can uh, continue to source those chats, we'll be able to have an opportunity to close it up with maybe one or two chat questions. Because this next question is really, I think, uh, critical. We know that nonprofit organizations um, have this dual partnership in terms of what we call a constructive partnership for leadership. We have CEOs or executive directors, and then we have a board of directors who are in a, should be an amazing group of diverse, both demographically diverse, cognitive, professionally diverse, geographically diverse um, uh, board members who are volunteers. Uh, and often boards struggle with how do you put together a truly diverse and inclusive board that represents those you serve, that represents your community. Um, board sources leading with intent from 2017 showed again that nonprofit boards are more white today than they ever were. In fact, our data from 2017 showed a decline in people of color on nonprofit boards over the data from 2015. Uh, we don't have the current data out from that study as of yet. We'll see if there's any improvement, but we know from just eyeballing it that many boards are still uh, not as diverse as we would like. So the question is, how do Black-led and Black-benefiting nonprofits develop effective allies to create strong boards that are diverse um, in all aspects of diversity, but specifically bringing Black and Brown people onto boards who have the prerequisite skill sets, but who have not been given the opportunities to lead uh, and to serve in these organizations. So um, why don't we go to uh, Anne and then Lauren and Charmaine, and we'd love to hear from you. Anne? Uh, oh, Robin, I love it. I love how you did the both and. The and is how do we provide um, more black and brown leaders and or people who are ready, willing, and available to serve on many nonprofit boards? And how do we attract strong boards for the Black-led, Black-founded, and Black-oriented um, organizations? And I think, again, and I love how Charmaine and Dietria and Lauren have really begun to focus on those aspects. Back to my hand. And let's start with how do we create the path for people, strong leaders who have access, influence, and the ability to really support the organization to serve on these Black-led organizations. And it all gets back to the basics. I love, Dietrich, you're talking about how you be present and visible in the community as a thought leader, as someone making a difference, but having not just the feelings and the big story, but the data to support you. So we look at those five critical success factors. We've heard it across this conversation already. Do you have a plan? Is it strategic? Have you developed it? Do you already have on your board people who have passion for the issue and mm -hmm. the capability to begin to support and bring the resources to that organization? I love it. The outstanding leadership is both and. Your staff leadership, do you do what you say you're going to do, delivering on your promise every day for whatever the mission is for this nonprofit? And board leadership, a diverse and or a strong board that loves the organization, is willing to speak out and speak up on its behalf. And even more importantly, and Robin, you and I talk about this all the time, one of the most important committees on any board is what? Board nominating and governance. Governance. Yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I want to. That's the committee I'm on on every yes. board, because mm -hmm. I want to bring in what? those people who reflect the community, the constituency served, as mm -hmm. well as those who can bring the resources to get the job done. Because as we say, there are only three things for any board to do: establish the strategic direction establish the resources so that that direction and strategy can be implemented. And oh, by the way, 
hold accountable the organization. Yes. yes, to get the job done. So that as well as not only do you have the strategy and outstanding leadership, but you have a compelling case. And that gets to you, Charmaine, the data, the facts, <laughs> to demonstrate, demonstrate results. It's not, how many times I'm looking at our team here, I mean, Lauren, how many times do we say, we hear people come, oh, we have a good idea. I'm going to start a nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> no. We don't. Yes, no, yes, no. We don't need another nonprofit. How do you work with those that are already going on so that how that you have a compelling case, a compelling need to demonstrate that in fact you are an organization that is the kind of place in which you want to invest. And you notice I didn't say worthy or deserving because there are a lot of deserving and worthy, but the and is we want something that can work and deliver on its promise. And to really have then a thought raising, a thoughtful fundraising plan. Do you have your 501c3? Do you have a financial plan? Do you have a budget? What's your E to R? Aha, you need to know some business terms. <laughs> What's your ROI? What's your E to R? And of course then, and we've talked about this across the board, and Dietria, I love that, that you just ended with it, is the stewardship. How do we steward and recognize and respect those who have made investments and begin to how do we then develop those people as our allies, talking about the bridge and the street, to cross the bridge, cross the street, to bring in those additional resources. But it, it is the leadership. Now, I'm going to, uh, Robin's going to love this. Do I read the Atlanta Business Chronicle? Yes, all the time. Yes. Do I see names in the news? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I would like to have that person on my yeah. board. And then you go back to your board. Who knows whom? Mm -hmm. It's all about People accepting yes to people, people giving to people, keeping people responding to people, and bring, people bringing their passion for the issue to your organization. So it's always, it's not really rocket science, but it is the ability to deliver on your promise, both to your constituency, and then to deliver on the financial accountability, as Charmaine was talking about, to those who invest in you so that they can, one, invest more, but also tell their friends to invest with you. Yeah, I love that, Anne. One of my best examples that I say to boards is uh, when they say, oh, we can't find any young people because of yes. course that's the other thing. <laughs> and I said, well, did you see in the Atlanta Business Chronicle, the 40 under 40? And, and those of you who are watching us from across other places Community. in the United States, you have a business chronicle because they're everywhere. Yes. They do basically the same formula. So they give the same awards. They do all the same things. They all, every, most large cities have a young leadership programs. And these, again, are people who have their hands up. They're saying, we're leaders. We want to be leaders. We want to volunteer. We want to make a difference. We want to have an impact. They're already standing ready to serve. And they are there for you to, as Ann said, look at them, see who knows who, or just meet them. That's what cultivating is about. We won't go through that. We'll have to set up another thing to talk about. How do you really form your board? So let's go to Lauren. And we're just going to hear a couple of comments from you, Lauren, about effective allies to create an effective board. How, how, what are your thoughts about how that should occur? Absolutely. So I'll, I'll continue a little bit of what Dietra um, introduced, which was you have to put yourself out there as well. So you have to start beginning to think about who is the ideal person to serve um, and, and what do they look like? What do they do? How are they engaged? Um, you can sort of mold and build that ideal profile and use that as an opportunity to build. Look at your existing board or very loyal volunteers and think about what is it about that person that I really enjoy and that makes me want to continue to work with them. So that's a quick one, one piece. And then the second, um, I wanted to add on to what you and Ann were saying. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about young professional engagement yes. um, because <laughs> it, it truly is the key. I mean, we have to begin to think about how we source and cultivate young people through our organizations. I see so many times um, across organizations that I'm involved with, the same names, the same people being tapped for these opportunities. And to be honest with y'all, they're probably a little tired. So think about the different <laughs> ways that you really can think about engaging new energy um, to be able to source and support 
support. And there's a, a journey along that as well. You can think about an advisory capacity or think about ways that they can share those innovative strategies. Um, but truly allowing people to feel like they have a seat at the table is truly how you build that allyship. You have to tell them you are valued, you are valuable in my journey, in my space. And again, people just want to know that you care and that you're willing to listen to them. And then you can continue to think about how you mold and navigate that relationship over time. Wonderful. Thank you, Lauren. And that, that term, when you said profile, we like to refer to that as a board composition. And every board should have one, those of you who are listening, because it allows you to really identify what the matrix is of the current board you have. And sometimes board members, when they see it, um, oh, wow, we're all in the same age range. Oh, wow, we all live in the same part of town. Oh, wow, we're all in the same industry. Then you clearly know that you do not have a board that is both demographically, professionally, in any other way diverse. Um, and it helps you, your governance committee and your nominating committee to be very intentional about the kind of board member that is that ideal board member for the one or two or however many board seats you have coming up um, because others are rolling off of their term limits because you use term limits. So I'm just throwing in little things here that I think are yes, really Yes, so Robin, I think <laughs> you go to board development, but I do encourage, and I didn't say this, is to use a board matrix, yes. which indicates all the kind of assets, skills, and experiences you need, right. as well as those diversity um, assets that are important to you. And that's not just black, white, or male, female, right. or gender identification. It's demographics and right. skills, and how to be intentional. Back to, back to you, Charmaine, there's so much intention to the invitation. I'm on a board now where I need a CFO. So right. I'm looking around at the Chronicle again for all the top CFOs. So I think it's in, it's all of that kind of we laugh about our corporate background, but it does take a kind of really strategic planning for an organization to be valued and heard for an investment. And it is an investment into which people want to lay claim to the big results you want to deliver. Absolutely. So let's go to Charmaine. So I will have to tell you, I was like, yes, I have something to add and Anne came back and said it. So I love when we think alike, but I'm gonna just share a little bit more. And that is anytime I'm on a board, I'm, I look, first of all, Anne, I'm with you. I am always on the governance board. I'm probably the only person who's like bylaws at all. I love bylaws. Oh, I love so, bylaws. <laughs> and, and, I, and the nominated mm -hmm. committee, but specifically right. governance. But I always start with a skills matrix. And it's not just skills, but it's also demographics, right? So the first thing is to take a skills matrix and demographics and plot out every member on the board, what skills do they have? What are their demographics? And then see where you have holes. Where you have gaps is where you start with what board members you need. So now you understand what you need, it's much easier to be intentional, that word I love so much, about how you go out and find those allies. And so I will tell you the next thing that I do is lean in on existing board members. Existing board members are your biggest advocates. They should be your cheerleaders for that organization. And if they aren't, that's really a time that we probably need to get them to go ahead and roll off so we can get somebody on that will be a cheerleader. And then the third thing is to look at, and I like the 80-20 rule, look at your top 20% donors that are individuals, look at your top 20 donors that are corporate partners, and then sit down with them and say, you've given to us, you're one of our largest donors, would you like to not just give us money, but how about thought leadership, right? How about serve on the board? The other thing is if it's somebody rolling off the board, who do you think would like being on the board? You love it, your ally, what friends, colleagues, other partners do you have that you can refer? I find that, I think Ann mentioned this, this is the best way to get really strong new board members is when they come referred by other board members or when they come referred by corporate partners. And I, I just wanna mention one thing because we talked about bringing young people in and even making sure that it's demographically um, or that it's very diverse. You have to be ready to bring in diversity. Mm -hmm. I have been on a number of boards where they have said, we want young people. And then we get the young person 
it, it's, it, it's, it's not a fit, right? And it's not a fit, not because of the young person, but because they weren't ready for them. They didn't have, you know, you have to have good orientation to explain, this is how it works. This is how we work. And so that that young person can bring their ideas and bring their innovation into an a environment that is open, right? An environment that says, we want to hear your idea. But then the young person has to also be okay if that idea doesn't get accepted that time, because maybe the next time it will get accepted. So again, it is another of those two-way streets, really strong communication about the existing board that you have and those new board members that you want to bring in. You want to have really strong orientation program that they come in and it becomes a really well engine, a, a well old board when you bring those new people in. So wonderful. Um, I think anyone who was taking notes <laughs> or who's going to go back and watch this later, you got at least a good two dozen um, ideas in this couple of minutes about how to create um, effective allies to really strengthen your board composition and some real tactical strategies of things that you really should be doing. I'm going to go to Deetra. I think she has, we have time for just one quick question, Deetra, because we do want to respect <laughs> our time. And then um, we're going to say our appreciations. So I'll turn it to you. Robin, that's exactly why I have you here, because you know <laughs> I get started on nonprofit work, and I just enjoyed this conversation, and I'm excited with having to be here with, with you all tonight. And so um, I will ask one quick question that I'm going to answer, and then there's one that I would love to lead, lead leave everybody with at the end because what I wanted more importantly for this event is for it to be somewhat like a starting of a toolkit for nonprofit leaders. So the first question that came through um, says, how as a new nonprofit do you get involved with already established nonprofits? And so I'll share a little bit of my experience when um, moving, you know, into Atlanta and then being able to uh, come into this space and work more closely on the ground. The previous organization I worked for, I traveled across 40 offices across the United States. So it was very difficult to, to set and be still and support one community. So I'm very, very grateful for this role because it has allowed me to get uh, more involved in the community, be back closer to my beloved Spelman College and do work that is very meaningful to me and my family. And so I would say to those individuals who wanna know how do you get, reach out to established nonprofits, you pick up the phone and you call. Because when I got here, I looked across our community and I saw the nonprofits that were doing work that was akin to my work. I saw people who were doing work that was um, something that I could leverage and support the work that I was doing. And I simply made phone calls and emails and I was met 100% with overwhelming support. Because one thing I can say about those of us who are in the nonprofit space that are on the ground working every day, we want to know who else is doing this work too. And we want you to know what we have learned and we want to share with you any pitfalls or mistakes we've made. And so the leaders that I called, thank you if you're listening and I appreciate you so much because they helped me and I want to be sure that our nonprofit, we're the exact same way. Um, there's a contact place on our website, please go there, connect with us, we'll share our resources with you. And the last question, Robin, I think is very important because this call does come uh, in the middle of what we're dealing with with the COVID pandemic. And so I want to ask Lauren and anyone else who has any insight, and I can weigh in a little bit, but what have you seen that has been creative fundraising that nonprofits have done during this time that you've seen become helpful for them in this moment? Absolutely. So one of the most effective things that I've seen as of late has been really taking what typically are longer drawn out campaigns and creating short term campaigns um, that folks can really rally around and then that you can share results about. Um, so a great example would be um, thinking about a particular cause or an immediate need that you are looking to serve, whether that's um, operational or it has something to do with your mission, especially um, culture. There are three different lanes a lot of times that you can function and so really think about what that small campaign could be. And then the important part, as Charmaine said, and everyone keeps elevating, is you have to share the results. You have to talk about the data. And being able to see that 
immediate return, not only on the messaging, the storytelling, the, the impact, um, that will continue to drive some momentum long term for people to say, okay, I see where my dollars have gone. I'm going to give again when they ask me, or I'm going to serve again when they ask me. Um, so I, I really like the way that organizations have taken um, short approaches to, to fundraising. Dietra, you also talked about friendraising, um, finding ways to, again, utilize a number of these platforms to engage. Um, one of the things that you can do on simple events like this is embed a, a link for people to give. We've seen it in the chat already tonight. Um, find ways to put that opportunity for people to plug in right in front of their face. You start to lose people after they have to click more than three times. So find a way to be able to put that information right in front of them. Be very, very direct about what that ask is and also what your goal is. I think those are two really critical ways and really important ways that people have started to, to rethink. And they're not outside of the box ideas. It's just a different way to use the tools and then also continuing to think about, okay, what do I have and how do I leverage that a little bit more effectively? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, panelists. This has gone above and beyond what I imagined. And I don't even know why, because this is, because you're so amazing. Um, I've enjoyed myself tremendously. Um, I know all of you, but I continue to get excited about just hearing you share um, so deeply from your experiences and so generously. I think that's the word that comes to my mind. You're so authentic and just so generous um, and so approachable. And I know that everyone who participated, I'm looking at the participants and nobody has left the room. You know, we always look at that when we're in face-to-face, -face. who's sneaking out the back door? Nobody left the room because of you. And so I want to give you an applause. Everybody, please join me so much in thanking Anne, Lauren, and Charmaine for just your generous spirit today. I'm going to turn it over to Deidre. Thank you, Robin. I cannot say, I can't even express how excited I am right now for uh, what we've been able to pull off today and the support. And so um, thank you to each one of you. I have a couple of things I want to give, and we're going to close out with a very short uh, informational video for you. But I do want to take a moment to um, just acknowledge the people who have made this event possible for us tonight. It's been very important for us to pull this off and get it all together and make sure we produced a quality event that could be beneficial to our community. But we are, Lauren, going to do uh, what you just said, a small campaign, because tomorrow we're going to kick off, which my staff doesn't know, um, because I kind of thought of it when you were talking, is um, a Give 828. So we're going to start a quick little campaign that yeah. is on the increments of 828. So $8.28, or we can do uh, what, $82.80, or, you know, okay. whatever the other zeros you add on the end of that. So just look tomorrow, you all will see all over the place our um, hashtags with the amount you can give. And we're going to make it easy, Lauren. There will not be clicks. And we hope that the other nonprofits who've joined tonight and those of you who will share this with many other nonprofits, that you know that are black led and black benefiting who could take this information and strengthen what they're doing. So at this time, I will um, follow the manners that my wonderful parents in Arkansas have taught me as to say thanks to number one, Shanice Turner. Shanice is our AmeriCorps VISTA member who has served with us during this event. And while she did not get a chance to come on camera tonight, I want to let her know because she has taught me so much by thinking up and dreaming of this event and helping me pull it off behind the scenes. And she has learned that millennial energy and um, Charmaine, as you said, when you have people come in that bring diversity of thought and experience and background, Shanice is an amazing uh, creative person. And so to her, I wanna say thank you because I'm grateful for you pushing me outside of my comfort zone to do something live and on uh, social media. So thank you to Lauren, and to Shanice. And I also wanna say to the American Technologies uh, Company who has brought in a huge amount of support for us. And they go above and beyond each time that they support our organization and they are the result of us friend raising. Um, and their company has supported our efforts and helped to make sure we are given AV support when we need. So. Um, again, I want to say thank you to you all. Be sure that you support tomorrow. Um, look into um, the organization that was started um, by Ms. Ebony Johnson Cooper, 
of the Young Black and Giving Back organization and just the leadership that she has shown in spearheading this event. And so I wanna give her kudos for this being the third year of operation and what we can do to help support her work and get this date across the United States so that we're giving in monumental ways in years to come on 828 in recognition of the work that she created. So I wanna say thank you and we'll close out with a short video and thank you all for your time. Martin Luther King Senior Community Resources Collaborative offers wraparound services to individuals and families in the capacity of employment services, family economic services, education services, housing services, as well as children and family services. Today, we highlight a community outreach initiative of the MLK Senior Collaborative focusing on the COVID-19 pandemic in our community. The Martin Luther King Senior Collaborative and other partners have joined with the Fulton County Board of Health to provide hashtag COVID-19 testing on Tuesday, September 1st from 8 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. in the parking lot behind the MLK Senior Complex. Interested test takers are strongly encouraged to register today by visiting www.mlkseniorcollaborative.org for an appointment prior to arriving at the test venue. Embrace the push to donate today. Click our donate button to learn more.